Watch this band nine ALF speaking interview, similar to a real exam in the month of July, with our candidate, Jack Hongir, an expert user of the English language. Let's begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. We have Jack Hongir with me here today from uh, Uzbekistan, who has recently scored a band nine on his IELTS exam, and he is going to share his IELTS adventure and tips mm -hmm. and strategies so you too can get this perfect band score. Welcome, Jack Hongir. It's great to have you here with us today. So, Jack Hongir, you recently sat the IELTS uh, where you scored a band nine on the speaking section. Can you just tell everybody when this IELTS speaking interview took place? It took place here in Uzbekistan, Tashkent. Uh, I took it with IDP. For those who don't know, like there are two organizations, IDP and British Council, where you can see the test. So, I set the test with IDP. Uh, it was, uh, as far as I remember, 30th July. So, I took it in Tashkent here. Yeah. Okay, so quite recently. All right, well, let's get into the interview. So in this case, I will be the examiner. Uh, of course, you are the candidate, and we will replicate this band nine situation. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the speaking section of the IELTS exam. My name is Adrian. I will be your examiner for this part of the test. I will give you instructions for each of the three parts. We are conducting the exam in Tashkent at Exam Center 7YQ9X. Let's begin. May I see your identification? Yes, sure, you can. Here you go. And what is your full name? Uh, my full name is uh, Isamidin of Jahangir, but you can call me just uh, Jahangir. Okay, Jahangir, for part one, I will ask you a couple of questions to get to know you better and some questions on a general topic. Do you work or study? I do both. Currently, I'm teaching. I've been teaching for the past five years. Uh, I also study. Uh, I studied at Westminster. I recently finished my bachelor's and now I'm doing my master's uh, at the same university. Yeah. What aspect of your job do you like the most? Uh, well, um, one of the things I really enjoy is being able to do what I love and also at the same time make money off of it. I absolutely love it, yeah. I love just meeting my students every day, helping them get good scores, and it's so great. I love it. I enjoy it, yeah. What changes do you want to see in your work? One of the things I would like my academy where I work, I, I want them to bring back is that when I just got into work about like three years ago into this academy, they would give teachers free seats. Uh, but there was like one condition, you had to get an eight or above, but now they no longer have it. If I'm not mistaken, you still can take it, but you have to sign like contract. Yeah, so you can take IELTS for free, but you either pay for it yourself or you will have to sign a contract, which I honestly, I don't really like it. Yeah, I would love it to change. Let's talk about animals. What is your favorite animal? I wouldn't say there are many, but uh, I have a few. I'd say like more specifically two animals. One is whales. I do really love whales. They are very social creatures, very intelligent, and I love their the social structure that they have in their family and it's absolutely amazing to see that and I'm also captivated by bees. I love bees. I know that not really many people appreciate the contribution bees make. I know that the pollinate flowers in like 70 or like 60 percent of what we eat every day just because bees pollinate flowers. Yeah, so these two animals. Are there wild animals in your country? Well, I'm not really well versed in the wildlife in my own country, uh, but I know that we have a few endangered species of this antelope called saiga. Uh, it's a weird looking animal. It's like an antelope with very small, like short antlers. And at the same time, instead of a nose, it's got like a elephant like trunk. Uh, so like very weird looking animal. And I think that's why it's hunted, poached, quite often and it's right now on the verge of extinction but we have a few like natural reserves where those animals are safeguarded. Have you ever seen wild animals? Not as often as I would like to and even when I did the problem was I basically saw captive animals like the ones that are kept in zoos in captivity in cages and I didn't really like the conditions those animals were kept in because 
Uh, most of the time they were not like properly taken care of, looked after, they were not properly fed. You would see them, they looked malnourished. Yeah, so I didn't really like it. And the one that I visited here in Tashkent, it also like smelled really bad. I don't really like seeing them in zoos, but nature reserves, yeah, one day maybe I'll get to see them there. I would love to see them there, yeah. Do you like watching animals in zoos? Not that much, as I said. It's, I'd say it's like a controversial take because I know that like zoos are a necessary evil. We need them. I know that quite a few zoos are involved in some breeding programs, like reintroduction, re reintroducing some endangered species of animals. They take them from the wilderness and then they have them breed in the zoo in like in safety and then they reintroduce them into the nature. So it might be fun at times. It, it might be interesting. It might be useful. But as much as I love like watching animals, I think I, I don't really like seeing them in zoos. Yeah. That is the end of part one. We will now continue with part two. For this part, I will show you a card with some questions. You will have one minute to read these questions. Think about your answers. You can take notes in this one minute time if you wish. You have your paper there and your pencil. And then you will have one to two minutes to speak. I will tell you when to start and when to stop. Is that clear? Yes, it is. Describe a journey that you took by car. Your one minute preparation time begins now. Mm -hmm. Your one minute preparation time is up. Mm -hmm. Please begin speaking. Okay, so I'm not really a massive fan of car journeys. It's basically because I have, uh, whenever I do car journeys in the past, I always had like very acute pain in my back. So I got problems with my back. About six months ago, I think, uh, eight months ago, uh, du during New Year, I wanted to go back to my hometown, to, to my family. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get hold of tickets. Like people, I think they bought them out months before New Year. So it, it came as a surprise, as a shock to me. So when I had to resort to, to, to this, you know, to the way that I didn't really love, didn't really enjoy. So with, my, with, with some of my friends, we hired a taxi driver. Uh, it was 27th or 28th of December, and it was very cold, freezing cold outside. And we, we found the driver, but unfortunately we had to wait for a few more hours before the driver could find some more passengers to take with us. Uh, after that, as soon as like we, we took off, uh, it took us about 12 hours and it's like a really long journey, like 12 hours of just sitting and not being able to move. We, we took a few stops, uh, gas stations, but the problem with the gas station at the time was they had like really long lines. So we had to wait for about one or two hours, I think two times. That's why it like took us so long because usually it would take us about eight or seven hours to get to my hometown from Tashkent. Uh, yeah, it, it was awful. Adding insult to injury was the fact that our driver, because it was like such a long journey, at the end he had to take a nap. He asked if he can, like we, we couldn't say no, because we knew if, if he drives in a sleepy state, it is just dangerous, we might get into car accident, so we didn't want it. So it was probably the most memorable and the worst car journey I've ever had in my life, yeah. Okay, your time is up. I will stop you there. Please put the note paper to the side, turn it over the pencil as well. And we will now continue with part three. For this part, I will ask you a question or two related to your part two response and some questions connected uh, to this topic. What could you do in the future to avoid such a discomforting uh, journey by car? I believe that, sincerely believe that people need to be proactive. So I think like planning just ahead, I'll try to plan ahead not just one week, two weeks ahead, I would say, like even a month. So I'll try to buy tickets one month before my departure. So yeah, I'll just try to be proactive in the future, yeah. Let's talk about driverless cars and cars in general. What do you think about the concept of driverless cars? It's intriguing, it's interesting but I'd say there are some ethical questions 
Um, honestly, I'm more than happy, you know, to have driverless cars and roads. I believe that robots, by their nature, like tend to be more precise, more accurate, and they're not prone to, you know, making the same kinds of mistakes that we humans do, like when we're driving drunk or when we're driving when we're tired. I think it's not going to happen as often with automated cars. But uh, I think people raised a few questions regarding uh, what if there, there are two people on the road and there is a car in the middle and your car like it's driving very fast and it needs to avoid the collision. Is the car going to take out the life of one of those people? And there are some ethical questions that we need to find a way to answer. And But overall, I'd be happy if there is enough data to show that they are like really safe and reliable. Yeah. Do you think it will be good to have driverless cars? Oh, absolutely. As you said, I think it will drastically reduce it as long as it's all uh, statistically that there is proof that they're safe. Then, yeah, absolutely. I would love to see more of them on the roads because especially here in Uzbekistan, the problem with drivers that most of them are very reckless and we that the drivers here in Uzbekistan, they tend to drive too fast, change the lanes too often and they never use turning signals and that's a problem. We have thousands of people dying on the roads and you don't want that and you want to save as many lives as possible and if driverless cars, they happen to be uh, one of the ways to reduce the number of casualties we have because of road collisions, I would be more than happy to accept it. Yeah, absolutely. Would it not be amazing to have flying cars? You know, I've recently watched an interview with this very popular physicist and scientist. Uh, I think his name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, he, he was talking about this concept of having flying cars and he said that we already have them. We actually already have flying cars, it's, it's helicopters. Uh, but the problem with flying cars is that the amount of thrust uh, and power they will have to generate uh, it must be equal to the weight of the car itself. So the, the problem is like we're going to have them, even if we have them, the uh, first ones will be very loud, very noisy. Another problem is like they might not be as energy efficient. So there are problems we need to consider first before trying to create them. And yeah, we, we already have them, it's helicopters. And you know, I think everybody knows that, that they're very loud, Yeah. What jobs require people to be good at driving? Um, there are several that come into my mind. The first one that I personally have seen quite a lot daily is ambulance drivers. Uh, and then we have truckers who need to drive trucks and bus drivers. So the ambulance drivers is that they need to be able to navigate through traffic. So at the same time, they, like, they need to be driving really fast and traffic at like high speeds and when there is like traffic jam is quite dangerous and I believe that ambulance drivers they go through rigorous training because they really need to be proficient because they're not just responsible for their own lives but they're also responsible for the lives of all of those drivers on the road and at the same time of the patients and the medical staff then we have uh, truck drivers because they are not always just driving the cabin itself, sometimes have trailers and sometimes they have several trailers behind and again it takes a lot of precision, a lot of experience to be able to feed the trailers and like the entire car into tight spaces, narrow spaces. Well, bus drivers, I guess, I think we have them everywhere and bus drivers, again, also responsible for the lives of all of the passengers they are they're driving and at the same time uh, they have lots of cars on the roads. So these three professions, like the first ones that come into my mind, yeah. That is the end of part three that concludes the speaking section of the IELTS exam. You will have your mark online in two days and the official certificate will be in the mail in about 10 days. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. All right, uh, Jacklinger, um, fantastic. Yes, definitely I can tell that you are an expert user of the English language. Uh, simply put, your fluency, your vocabulary, your ability to stay on topic and to create clarity by often paraphrasing what you're saying. Um, so you have a very quick and clever ability uh, for coming up with a synonyms and expressions to further clarify your points. And I can see why the examiner 
uh, would have scored you uh, that band nine on July 30th. Uh, and uh, of course, we will be highlighting uh, these uh, vocabulary, as many of our viewers will see uh, throughout the interview. Uh, Jahong here, if you could give one tip for IELTS candidates for getting the best score on their speaking interview, what would that be? Oh, let me think. I firmly believe that IELTS is a very standardized test and you have a set number of topics that you might be asked during your exam. So if you have questions about speaking, I'd say that there are like many speaking apps and plus there are many websites that you can go to and find all of the most frequently asked questions. So you can find all of those topics and get ready for them before your test. It, it does not mean that you have to memorize everything before the test, all of your answers, ideas, vocabulary. No, but at least you need to familiarize yourself with the types of questions that you might get asked during your exam. That's the problem I had in first few tries. I wasn't really taking it seriously, thought that I can, you know, ace any topic easily, but no, I failed a few times miserably, but experience showed me that it's better if you get ready before the exam by just familiarizing yourself with all the types of questions you might get asked. Yeah. I think that is a great tip. Absolutely. Um, students often try to predict the topics, which is unrealistic because, as you said, there's a kind of a set number of topics and there's a reason for that. It's because the IELTS questions should be possible to answer for just about any person, whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's an 18-year-old or a 35-year-old. And so the topics tend to be common topics, such as talking about uh, driving uh, vehicles or going on a road trip. And of course, uh, we can assume or infer that most people have had that experience of being in a car. However, there are a lot of common experiences and we're not as familiar with some of them as others. Some of us are not too familiar with topics about art or dancing and it's very important to cover these and there are a lot of great websites out there like the website that we have, uh, aehelp.com for mm -hmm. academic IELTS or gieltshelp.com for uh, general IELTS. So um, it's important to visit these, try various topics and try those topics especially that a candidate might not be too comfortable with, like talking about dancing if it's not their cup of tea, for instance, or talking about mathematics if it's uh, not their cup of tea. That's what happened to me when I sat the outs. My mm -hmm. part one topic was about math and I'm not a huge fan of math, but I have practiced talking about math in the past and so I was okay on that topic of course as well. Uh, Jacqueline, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, today and um, we hope to uh, visit with you again and get some more insights and present another uh, speaking interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. To see many more speaking videos like this one, including original practice exams, a fully interactive course, and an app for your phone, visit and join our premium IELTS package at gieltshelp.com. Use the code DRIVE9 for an additional 10% discount. Simply click the link in the video description below. We are an IDP affiliate, a British Council partner, an IELTS test registration center, and I'm a certified British Council agent. Begin learning for success. Join now. Subscribe to our channel. Click over here. Watch another video. Click right up here. And join our premium package. Click on our hero to practice your speaking, get videos, exams, and an interactive course.